And we are glad you are here today. Thank you for coming out and worshiping with us. We are genuinely glad. If you're a guest today, make yourself at home, and we pray God will feed you richly from his word, that you'll leave her today with something to take home that you can apply to your life. Now, we are just getting our feet wet in a series, a rather long series, that we have entitled The Ten. It's got several taglines, trust and obey, they're more than rules, love God, love people, and that really is the big, big picture of what we are doing. Now, we've learned two important things that you're going to hear kind of over and over again because I really want to solidify them in our hearts long after this series is over. And the first one is this, that God gave really the law, but God gave the rules, God gave the Ten Commandments, not to get us in but because we are in. Do you remember where he said, and the Lord spoke these words to Moses and said, I am the Lord, your God, and I'm the God who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of bondage. And amazingly, that happened before he gave one rule. So apparently, and obviously, the rules are not to get us in God's good graces. In fact, we've learned over and over again that there is no giant scale. That keeping rules and laws could never tip the scales in our favor. It comes, rather, by faith and grace. And what happened was the Israelite people had trusted God while they were still in Egypt. And that's how they got out of Egypt, by trusting God. And how we get into God's favor is by grace and faith, by trusting him, not by trying to tip a scale in our favor. So that's the first thing we learned. And the second thing we learned is something that Jesus said. Here's what he said. He said, he was asked a question, so what are the greatest commandments? What is the greatest commandment? And he answered and said this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, there's no greater commandments than this. So we learned last week that we're going to look at the 10 through the lens of two. We're going to look at the whole Ten Commandments. You're going to discover the first four talk about loving God, and then the last six talk about loving people. Through the lens of two, we see the ten. Huge, huge thing. So, so very, very important. So as we look today, if you want to go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. That's where we'll jump off today. Now, all right, again, we've had introduction, 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 and now we're fixing to get the first commandment. The first thing God is going to tell us about how to live in, in our lives with him, what, what do we do, how do we do that, and he gives us the first command. I don't know what you would expect. I mean, there's only going to be 10 of these, so I don't know what you would expect, but here's what he says. He says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. So of all the, all the things you might expect God to say, the first thing he says is, now listen, there's only one God and that is me. And you're not to make an image, any kind carved from the earth or water or anything else. Now you might say, see, Dwayne, that's exactly why I was, looking, I was not looking forward to this series. We, we take something way back, 1,500 years ago, and you expect us to drag it into our lives today. And the answer is, that's what I love about the Word of God. It is so, so appropriate for today. Imagine this. Imagine a man who has a really bad cough. It's the kind of cough that keeps you awake all night. It's the kind of cough that you can't finish a sentence, a conversation without <coughs> cough, coughing. And so finally, this man decides to go to the doctor. He gets to the doctor and explains to the doctor what's going on, which was pretty obvious because he was coughing. And the doctor runs his test. And the conclusion is lung cancer. So the doctor understands how difficult that news might be. And so rather than tell him lung cancer, he prescribes him a very, very strong cough syrup. He says, take this home and use this. And sure enough, the man was satisfied with his prognosis, and also the cough syrup worked. He could now sleep through the night. He could now finish those conversations. But slowly... 
slowly, slowly, the cancer was eating away at his body. You see, that illustration came from Kyle Ottoman in his book, God's at War. And Kyle goes on and says this. And boy, I, I, all I could say was amen. Again, I've been a pastor now for 32 years. And I've seen people come in my office and they tell me about anger and they tell me about jealousy and they tell me about lust and they tell me about other things in their lives that are just horrendous and horrible. And, and they say, my, my, I've cheated on my wife, I'm mean to my children, and on and on they go. And the thing they don't understand is what they're describing is, is the cough. They're describing a symptom. And Kyle Allman says that's a symptom of not a sin, but the sin. And that sin is idolatry. And that sin is idolatry. And the reason why this, this text is so appropriate for us today it's because where we live today, no, no, I would probably go to your house and there's not going to be a Buddha sitting on a shelf. I would go to your house and there's probably not some other shrine that you set up to another God. But as we look around our world today and look, as we look around our lives today, if we look carefully, there are gods everywhere that we look. So God says there should be no other gods before me. He says we should not make an image. But again, there are gods all around us. These, these symptoms are not the problem. Again, we don't have a pride problem. We have an idolatry problem. We don't have a jealousy problem. We have an idolatry problem. We don't have a lust problem. We have an idolatry problem. Now, you might say, Dwayne, how do these things happen in our lives. How, how is it? And I hope, I hope before we're said and done that you'll understand, yeah, you know, those things are there. How does that happen? Well, you remember a guy named Lance Armstrong? He was a hero. I mean, I never watched a bicycle race in my life until Lance Armstrong came along. And time after time, he would ride in the Tour de France. And for a record seven times in a row, he won. Never happened before and then somewhere along the way he lost his way later on it was revealed that he was doping he was using illegal drugs to get a performance that was not normal and in the end he was stripped of all seven titles he lost his character he lost everything how did that happen somewhere along the way Lance lost his focus from winning to doing anything at all to win. If you're a little bit older than, than some here, you might remember a president called Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon had a pretty powerful political legacy going on. He was the president that finally ended the Vietnam War. He, he was argumentatively the most powerful man in the world, and he had just won the election, re-election, handily. He was set. But somewhere along the way, he approved and had knowledge of a break-in at a hotel called Watergate. And because of that, he became the only president in history to resign. And instead of a strong political legacy, he has no legacy. He's known as the lying president. He's known as the president forced to step down. How did that happen? How did Richard Nixon lose his way? How did he lose his focus? I grew up in my later years, younger years, watching the Cosby show. Bill Cosby was the, 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 the epitome of what really good TV was about. He, he played a dad and and he and his wife on television just had this incredible family. And we watched it. He made us laugh. His comedy was clean. I remember when one of his daughters, his TV daughters, kind of went the wayside and, post, and posed for pictures that were inappropriate in a magazine. He made sure that she set out a season because it's so inappropriate for the show. And then word got out. I didn't want to believe it. I, I said, you know, it can't be true. These women are lying. 
And then there's this admission of 2005 where he did fail morally, morally, miserably. How did it happen? How did a guy that stood for so much that was right fail morally so miserably? Somewhere along the way, Bill Cosby lost his way. He lost his vision. I don't know those guys' spiritual condition. I, I don't know if they're saved or lost. And you might say, see, Dwayne, that's not appropriate. Well, it is because it teaches what happens when we lose our focus. What, what happens when we say, okay, it's okay to have another God? How, how does it, how, you know, what happens and how, what does it show how that when we have a God that, that, you know, we've made of our own making, a carved image, we've allowed something in our life to replace God? Of course, then there's this guy... I won't use his name because it served no purpose. But he's the grandson of Billy Graham. And he was chosen when D. James Kennedy died. And D. James Kennedy was the conservative preacher, even though he's a Presbyterian. He was the conservative preacher of the day at Coral Ridge Ministries. And when he died, Billy Graham's grandson, this man, was chosen to take his place. I heard him speak. I called this man sitting right here. I said, I just heard the most powerful message. This guy's incredible. And then very recently, he had to resign his pastorate. Sadly, he, he seemed to point a finger at his wife. It was her fault because she had an affair. And in the process of, of healing from that, he had an affair. And the grandson of Billy Graham, resigned, lost his ministry, and lost his character. How did that happen? How did that happen? Somewhere along the way, he lost his focus. And look at me. That's what happens to us. As we journey through life, if we, as believers, if we are not careful, we will lose our focus. And those things, False gods creep in. If you'd seen the video today, there was a, a statement there that said, you see, anything can be a building block for a false god. It doesn't have to be a Buddha. It doesn't have to be a Muhammad. Anything that we choose to put before God becomes a god. Anything we choose in priority to come before God becomes our god. When God said, you shall have no other gods before me, he wasn't talking about, I've got to be number one, as if there's a lion of gods behind your life. As long as I'm number one, it's okay. Just, don't have, just make sure those other gods stay in line. No, 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 no. No, in the Hebrew, it is clear. God is saying, in his presence, there is no other gods. It's not like there's a popularity contest and God always wins in our lives. He's saying that if I am your God... There will be no line of gods. There'll be no list of God. There'll be no hierarchy of gods. I alone am God. And every time we let jealousy rule, every time we let lust rule, every time we let adultery rule, every time we let anger rule, see, it doesn't have to be this, this nuclear bomb of sin. But every time we say yes to sin and dwell in that and live in that, we're making idols, our jobs, sports, families. See, the crazy part is, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. It can be a neutral thing. But when we choose to worship those neutral things, they become a God. And he says, have no other gods before me. I, told, I entitled the message today, The God Factory, because we have a tendency to make gods. Over in, in 1 John, and we just started studying 1 John um, on Wednesday nights, if that interests you, but, but John the Apostle wrote in 1 John 2.15, he says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. That goes right along. When God said, you'll have no other gods before me, he said, don't love the world or even the things of the world. He says, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, their pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So he's saying that as we journey through life, if we're not careful, our eyes can become an assembly line at the God-making factory. We can see and desire and see and want. If we're not careful, our mind can be on the assembly line of a God-making factory. And we start thinking outside of what God would have us think. He's saying that, that our ears can become the assembly line of a God as we hear the wrong things. And he's saying, I will not have you with another God in your life. And then he says, be careful as you journey and walk that you don't become a God-making factory. And probably what makes it so difficult is that it can be an amoral thing. It can be a neutral thing and become a God. Now, it's so cool if that's an appropriate word, because Scripture gives us a clear example of what happens. And what's really ironic is this story I'm about to share with you from Exodus chapter 32 takes place while Moses is on the mountain, while he's up there getting the rules, getting the law of how God wants us to live. Then the people are doing something in the valley that contradicts what he's, what he's fixing to give them. In Exodus chapter 32, it goes something like this. Now when the people saw, and this is verse 1, now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him. So, so Moses is gone, Aaron's in charge, and the people come to Aaron, and here's what they say. Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this man, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do, know, we do not know what's become of him. Do you see that? They confused Moses and God. This man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, guess what? A man didn't bring him out of Egypt. God did. God did. This man, Moses, and, and they looked at Moses and it was a love-hate relationship. One minute they loved Moses, and wow, what a leader. And next minute they want to stone him and kill him. It all depended if there was water to drink that day. They were pretty fickle. But at this point they're saying, this man, Moses, who started us on this journey, this man, our leader, he's gone. We don't even know what happened to him. And so, won't you make a new God for us? And they, they really... In their eyes, they weren't rejecting Yahweh as much as they needed something to hang on to. They needed something physical. Since Moses wasn't there, they needed something physical to hang on to. So they told Aaron, make us a God. See, we get confused. We get confused like they confused God and Moses. We get confused about what makes a full and purposeful life. See, God didn't give us the rules just to give us rules. I, I, things, you know, remember the old commercial, things go better with Coke? Well, things go better with God. Amen. I mean, not, not to mention eternity. Eternity goes a lot better with God because if you've got a relationship with God in your eternity, you're going to heaven. If you don't have a relationship with God, you spend eternity separated from him in a place called hell. Things go better with God. But the bottom line is, and you need to nail this down in your heart, things go better with God Day by day. I don't know about you. I, I don't know if you've ever had an affair or something like that. But the day you were found out or the day you told your wife, I bet that wasn't a very good day. Or last night when you laid your pillow, your head down on the pillow, and those conversations are going around in your head about how you hate someone, hard to go to sleep that way. And, and, or you, you get up and go into work not knowing if you got a job that day because your future's held in the hand of some man who owns a company and it may be the day that you get the pink slip and you're counting on that job. See, we get confused. And we start thinking that a thing can be the source of happiness. A thing can be the source of hope. A, a, a thing can be the source of security. Hope and happiness and security are not found in things. They are found in a relationship with God. Amen. But in this culture we live in, we 
go and we go to our God factory and we say, if I had that car, if I had that house, if I had his job, if I had that wife or different children, I would be happy. I would have hope. I would have peace. You don't buy it at Jim Hayes and you don't buy it at Walmart. You don't buy it from a realtor. And God knew that. And that's why he said, don't make a carved image like anything. Don't make another God. Because there's only one true God. And that one true God is the one who can give you peace, security, hope, and happiness. Within the realm of God, that word happiness. They confused gods with Moses. And they opened up a God factory. If, if, if you'll make, Aaron, if you'll make us a God, we'll feel secure. If, if you'll, and, and they came out of Egypt. I mean, Egypt was like, like God, like God superstore. They had gods for neighborhoods. They had gods for frogs and gnats. And every, they had gods for everything. And their culture was saying, and their, their past culture was saying, well, they had a lot of gods. Maybe if we had, we, you know, we lost Moses, so maybe if we get us another one, it'll work. I'll be happier. I'll be more secure. And guys, we do that in America a lot. If I had, I would be. Well, amazingly, I think it just shows how imperfect leaders are. And Aaron said to them, Bring off the golden, break off, I'm sorry, break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives and sons and daughters and bring them to me. What was Aaron thinking? Peer pressure? Popularity contest? I don't know. But he tells the people, Go get me some gold and I will make you a God. Have you ever wondered where they got the gold? I mean, these were slave people. For 400 years, they knew nothing but a little bit of gruel that, that they were able to eke out of living there in Egypt and hard work. That's all they knew. And yet Aaron says, go and get the gold earrings, break them off and bring them to me. Where did they get the gold? Well, God. When they were leaving, when they're getting ready to leave Egypt, God says to them, "Tell the, how arrogant! Tell the Egyptians to give you gold. Pilfer, the word used, pilfer the land of Egypt." And by the time that God had gotten done with the Egyptians and their false gods, all of that, when the Israelites said, "Give us gold," they dumped on them. Anything, just leave. And they got all this gold. I really believe that God intended that gold to be used to glorify Him. They took the gold and used it to defame Him. How about us? I've, I was laying in bed last night, and sometimes I forget this. So we're laying in bed. I said, Judy, we are so blessed. We are just so blessed. I mean, most of us sitting here today, even if, you're, even if your pile's not very high, you'd go, you know what, I'm blessed. I mean, I was watching, I watched the strangest TV shows. Judy calls them boring. So I got up yesterday morning, had my coffee, and, and I watched the local news, and I got bored with that. And so I flipped over and found a program called Dangerous Journeys. And about this time, big guy walks in, he's sleepy, he sits down next to Papa, and we're watching Dangerous Journeys. And it's about uh, Georgia, not Georgia, but Georgia, Russia. And how that in the remotest part of Siberia, there are these very poor, poor, poor villages. And one man has a zillion-year-old truck. And his job is to go and get food and over very dangerous roads with his life in danger from rock slides and for snow slides to get to a village and deliver the food. And I said, big guy, he's the only truck. 
I said, big guy, there, he said, he got stuck, and they said it might be days before another truck came by. I said, big guy, we got trucks. We got cars. We got food. We have air conditioning. We are blessed. But here's, if you take anything home, here's the gigantic red flag. It's easy to take the blessings of God and turn them into God's. It's easy to take the blessings of God and turn them into God. We take the fact that God's given us a title, God's given us a good job, and it's so easy to take that money or that position and use it for ourselves, placing it before God. That's why this is appropriate. And the, cool, the part where we want you to get a hold of is this. Not only is that offensive to God, and that's why God said don't do it, it's dangerous. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. I just happen to believe that when we live, because God is so gracious and gave us his holy word, and again, I believe his, his word is the best life. You know, one of our famous preachers says, your best life now. Well, your best life now is not mansions and Cadillacs, Cadillacs and lots of money. Your best life now is found within the word of God. It's found within the word of God. Not that God winks at you and shows you favor. It's just the best way to live. It's just the best way to live. So they, confused, go to Aaron, make us a God. Give me your gold. Verse 3, And so all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. And then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And if this is not confusing, I don't know what is. I, the word, it says, And they said, This is your God. Aaron makes the God. And then the people claim, This is the God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And whoa, 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 whoa. This is just a little gold calf. It didn't even exist until right now. How in the world can you say this is what out of Egypt? It's amazing how confused we can get when we muddle with false gods. It's amazing. The landscape is littered with men in the ministry who, for whatever reason, threw their ministries away because of moral failure. The landscape is littered. I'm going to tell you what my response is. In case you're saying, well, Dwayne, how do you respond to that? God, please don't let me be stupid. It scares me to death because I think it happened to anyone. Anyone. You won't find much pride or arrogance in that area. You may find it in other areas, but you won't find it in that area of my life. Because I realize just how stupid I can be. So God, please protect me from my stupidity. That's my response. But the landscape is littered with good men who failed morally. Good men who are prideful. And if it can happen to those guys, it can happen to us. The warning is be careful because the consequences are so dire. When we preach on adultery in a few weeks, a pastor came up with a list of 40 things that an affair will cost you. We'll read part of that list that morning. Part of the list that morning. Be careful because, again, these sins are just symptoms of the fact that something has replaced God in your life. That's the key thought. It's not just an adultery problem or a stealing problem or a lying problem. Something has replaced God, including, excuse me, religion. Religion. Anything that comes before God. Ministries. Ministries. Anything that comes before God becomes a God. So Aaron responds and says, he said, so Aaron sought and built an altar. Go figure, Aaron. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. It's like the, we do such a good job. 
I've heard people say this. How can she or how can he come to church with that in their lives? When you get false gods, you can justify anything. I mean, here's Aaron, and so he mixes it all up. He just mixes it all up. Does what we do. You know, we get drunk on Friday night, and we come to church on Sunday morning. You beat your wife on Saturday and come to church on Sunday morning. Bubba does that in the South all the time. Just go to church. Aaron says, we'll just proclaim a feast. So tomorrow is a feast day. He mixes in a little bit of God. He mixes in a little bit of false gods. And voila, we're going to have a party. (laughs) What a party. So they rose up early. Couldn't wait. They rose up early on the next day, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. That's where false gods end up. When we manufacture these gods in our lives, which, by the way, we may be totally blind to. Again, we think we have an anger problem. No, you have an idolatry problem because you're worshiping the anger and allowed it to have its way in your life and not allowing God to have his way in your life. And we rise and we rise up and we play. And a lost world goes to hell. God's name is is defamed, and that's next week. We lose our credibility in the world. People say, if that's Christianity, and and please keep in mind, because I've talked too much about the sex stuff. When they see you in anger in public, that damages the name of Christ. And when people say, why don't you receive Christ, and they say, I know a person who claims to be a Christian, and I saw him in public doing this, and if that's that, I don't want that. Wow. You see the importance of this? Y'all way too quiet. You see the importance of this? I'm telling you, this can cost you your marriage. It can cost you your relationship with your kids. It can cost you your career and your character. That's why God put it number one. He says, when we get into the God-making business, things go south quickly. The answer is, have no other gods before me. Not that I've got number one, I'm the only one. And resist the temptation, resist the temptation to make gods. Now, Andy Stanley did a series called The Sinai Code, and I listened to part of it a long time ago. But he said something I thought was pretty good. Why would you? Excuse me. Why would we want other gods? Why do I feel the need? I'm being transparent and and letting you off the hook. Why would I feel the need to be a, a, a god on the pulpit. Why would I say, oh, it's all about me when it should be all about him? Why, why should I, why should I, why should I want, why would we want to say, if I had this, I would be fulfilled when this should be Jesus and I should be fulfilled? How, how do we avoid this? This was rolling around in my head, by the way. (laughs) And I'm going, I'm going, okay. You know, we just talked about the other day. We were laughing. We were at Cynthia Fox's house for supper on Thursday night. And and Cynthia made the the comment that um, it's not a sermon at Dorsey without food. (laughs) We got to mention food somewhere along the road, you know. Well, today's been sex. (laughs) Are y'all going to laugh or anything? (laughs) I'm starting to fear for my job up here. (laughs) You know, the best way 
the best way to guard your marriage is to be so in love with your spouse, no one else competes. In other words, to be in so in love, not you, <laughs> for me, to be so in love with her that all you women in the building don't even look attractive. Sorry. <laughs> to be so enamored with her that nothing else attracts me or draws me. Where are you going, Dwayne? The best way to make sure you don't have a, a prolifera of gods, I've been wanting to use that word all day, a prolifera of God, and I'm not even saying it right, prolifera of gods is to make your God so attractive, the true God so attractive, that nothing else draws you. Huh? Huh? Listen to this. Listen to this. For you, Lord, the psalmist, for you, Lord, are kind and ready to forgive, rich in faithful love to all who call on you. Does your bank account have that ability? Does your job have that ability, your position? Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my plea for mercy. I call on you in the day of my distress, for you will answer me. Does your car do that for you? Lord, there is no one like you among the gods, and there are no works like yours. All the nations you have made, you have made, will come and bow down before you, Lord, and will honor your name, for you are great and perform wonders. You alone are God. Teach me your way, Yahweh, and I will live in your truth. Give me an undivided mind to fear your name. When you understand and realize just how awesome God is, other gods won't be attractive. But as long as you're sitting there saying, and this goes right along the Sunday school lesson, Miranda. Right along the Sunday school lesson. As long as you're sitting there going, yeah, God, but you didn't. Yeah, God, I asked you and you didn't give it to me. Yeah, God, I wanted and you didn't, you didn't come through, God. How many times have we said it? If he did nothing else than this, it's enough. If he did nothing else than this, if I was the poorest man in the world, if my health went south, if he did nothing else but that, that is enough. And that is how we are going to keep these false gods out of our lives. That is how we're going to begin to understand. We have to be careful not to be a God factory. And by the way, you don't know what's cool? I said this earlier in a little statement. I'm going to make a big statement. 1 Timothy chapter 6, and I think it's verse, yeah, verse 17, says this. God has given us all things to richly enjoy. There is nothing wrong with a big house. There is nothing wrong with a big car. Nothing wrong with a big television. No. But when those things become more important than God then you've got a problem. See, the problem isn't, let's all go sell our stuff, move to Montana, get on white robes and chant. That's not the answer. The answer is to keep a, pop, a proper perspective on things. That things are things to be used in parentheses for the glory of God and not for them to own you. Nothing wrong with things. It's just when they become a god, there is a problem. He closes, now we're back in Exodus 20, and he closes with these words that seem harsh but beautiful. The, the last part of verse 5 and, 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 and then verse 6 of Exodus 20. For I, the Lord your God, I'm a jealous God. And I want to pause there. I mean, he's jealous in the sense that I don't want a line. I mean, I'm telling you, Judy would never go. Judy would never go and say, Dwayne, you can have as many girlfriends as you want just as long as I'm number one. That ain't going to happen. <laughs> Judy just said amen. <laughs> it's not going to happen. No, she wants her to be the only one. Well, God's saying, 
I'm number one. And there's nobody else behind the list. That's all. He's jealous in that sense. I'm not going to be in competition with your false gods. But also he's jealous for us. Oh, how he loves me. He did not save me and leave me here to try to fight in my own power, victory over sin, death, and the grave. He gave me that victory over sin and the grave. He has given me through his Holy Spirit the power to be victorious over sin. He's jealous for me because he loves me. He knows what the enemy can do. He says, I'm jealous for you, and I love you. I am a jealous God. And here's the harsh part. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. And that is a picture of judgment outside of grace. That if we, if we somehow determine, sorry, Dwayne, not buying what you're selling, I'm doing the scale thing, and I'm going to try to win God's favor. It's a picture you don't want because you could never earn God's favor. But then he turns around and says, here's the beautiful part. And says, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commands. Now, don't get confused there. He's not saying if we love God and keep his commands that we've earned his favor. Because Jesus said, over in the book of John, he said, if you love me, keep my commands. It's just a way for us to demonstrate our love for him. That's all. There's no earning a favor. It's a way to demonstrate our love for him. That's what it is. He shows mercy to thousands who love me. So what's the bottom line? What's the takeaway? I'm not sure you're supposed to have two bottom lines, but I'm going to give you two anyway. The first is this. Leave knowing that God wants no competition. Just nail that down in your heart. That if anywhere in your life you find something competing for, for the affection you have for God, warning, red flag, there's one God. And understand that out of control, our mind excuse me, our mind and our eyes particularly can become God factories as we lust and want what the world offers. Nothing wrong with things. But when they become our gods, that's a big problem. Remember, we don't have an adultery, adultery problem. We don't have a pride problem. We don't have a lust problem. We have what? An idolatry problem. Anything before God is a God. Would you bow your heads right there, please?